Hi, Math 34 students. This is module 10, example one on page 185. Make sure you've read through your vocabulary first. Once you have read through the vocabulary, you'll notice that we're shifting now to looking at means with our z-score. Previously in modules eight and nine, we were looking at proportions which come from categorical data. So now we're gonna shift and use the z-score in terms of means uh, which come from quantitative data. So you may remember earlier in the semester we were looking at means and quantitative data. Now we're going to do some z-score calculations and hypothesis testing with the quantitative data. The National College Athletic Association, abbreviated NCAA, requires freshman Division II athletes to score at least 820 combined total on both sections of the SAT exam. And then it tells us the scores of the 1.5 million high school seniors who took the SAT last year were approximately normal, with a mean 1,026 and standard deviation 209. So approximately normal tells us that it falls into the bell-shaped curve and that these scores come from all 1.5 million high school seniors tell us that these are parameters from the whole population. Question A asks, how many standard deviations away from the mean is an SAT score of 820? And then it's asking us to use the z-score formula to solve. So here in our z-score formula, for our x value, we're putting in 820 because that's the data value we're analyzing. We're subtracting 1026 because that's our population mean. And we're dividing by 209 for standard deviation of the whole population. When we subtract, we get a negative value because 820 is less than the mean, and it's negative 0 0.986, which if we round it to two decimal places, we get negative 0 0.99. So we can conclude that our z value is negative 0 0.99 standard deviations from the mean, so real close to one standard deviation below. Since it's below the mean, we're expecting less than 50% students would have that score. That'd be less than the 50th percentile, we would say. Question B asks, what percent of freshmen qualify for Division II college sports? Or in other words, what percent of freshmen had SAT scores of 820 or higher? So we can use the z-score table to find this percent. So use the table on page 167, and we can see that P equals 0 0.1611 corresponds with our z-score of negative 0 0.99. So remember the 0.9 in the tenths place, we find that on the columns, or on the rows, and then the 9 in the hundredths place, we move over in the columns to find so start with the rows, find the tenths place, and then move over to the nine in the columns. The table tells us that the proportion of students who scored below 820. Now if you look back, the question is asking about who scored 820 or higher. So since the question is asking about scores 820 or higher, we need to subtract from one. So down here I did this calculation, 1.00 subtract 0.1. 611, and that left us with 0 0.8389. So this is the proportion of students who scored higher than 820. And then if we want to convert that to a percent, we see 83.89% of freshmen had SAT scores 820 or higher. Part C tells us that the NCAA will consider a student to be a partial qualifier with satisfactory high school grades and a combined SAT score of 720. So this is the lower limit, the partial qualification. And then it asks how many standard deviations away is an SAT score of 720. And we're going to use our z-score formula again. So again, here for 720, I've put that in the place of the x value. I'm subtracting from the same mean, 1026, and I'm dividing by 209. And if we calculate this through, we get 
negative 1.464 standard deviations. So we can make a nice complete sentence here, an SAT score of 720 is negative 1.464 standard deviations below the mean. And this makes sense because it's a lower score than the um, 820 that we saw in part A, so we expect that the z-score is going to be further negative. Okay, if I'd asked about the proportion, you could go look it up in your um, z-score table on page 167. You can also use your calculator, uh, so you can look at the calculator examples and see how you could put this into the z-test to figure out the p-value. Question D now asks us to find the 95% confidence interval for the SAT scores of high schoolers last year. So let's go ahead and start with our upper bound. So our upper bound, we're going to start with our mean of 1026. And then we're going to add two standard deviations because we're at 95% confidence. So we'll say plus 2 times 209, and we end up with 1044 is the upper limit SAT score. For our lower bound, we've got 1026 subtract 2 times 209, and we get 608 as our SAT score for the lower bound. So you can see this is the same types of calculations that we were doing with proportions, and even earlier we did these same calculations with means. So because it's quantitative data, the SAT scores come out as numbers, that's why we're looking at uh, means instead of proportions. So now we can say our 95% confidence interval is from 608 to 1,444. So we could be 95% confident that the true um, mean lies in here. And now we don't need to have the comma and the two, so I'm just going to leave that at the comma. Okay, let's go ahead and look at example two on page 80, 186. So example two takes us through vocabulary. So question A says, in a matched pairs experiment, subjects push buttons as quickly as they could after taking a caffeine pill and also after taking a placebo pill. So the mean pushes of this button per minute were 283 for the placebo and 311 for caffeine. So this is showing us that after um, taking caffeine, people are pushing the button more quickly. And then it asks, is each of the bold numbers a parameter or a statistic? So these numbers both come from an experiment. So that tells us that they are statistics. Okay, um, the sample mean for calculation purposes and a match pairs experiment is calculated by subtracting the caffeine value and the placebo value. Okay, so if you wondered what you would use for the mean in a match pair study, you would subtract. Just as a refresher, remember match pairs is when you have um, two types of data collected and then one is usually the placebo and then one is when something's affected. Question B tells us that the Bureau of Labor Statistics announces that last month it interviewed all members of the labor force in a sample of 60,000 households. And it tells us that 8.9% of the people interviewed were unemployed. So we want to know what is this bold font number? So because it comes from a sample of 60,000 households, even though it's a really big sample, it is still a statistic. 
So we can go ahead and circle statistic. And again, that's because it's telling us in the problem that this data comes from a sample. Question C tells us a study of voting shows 663 registered voters at random shortly after an election. Of those, so this is the people from the sample, 72% said that they had voted in the election. Election records show that only 56% of the registered voters voted in the election. And it's asking us about the bold font number. So the bold font number is 56%. So remember, 56% is from all election records. So that 56% is a parameter because it comes from all election records. The 72%, if they'd asked about that because that came from a sample of 663, that would be a statistic. But because they're asking about the bold 56% that came from all registers voters, that's a parameter. Question D tells us scores on the mathematics part of the SAT exam in recent year were roughly normal with mean 515 and standard deviation 114. You choose a SRS, remember that's a simple random sample, of 100 students and average their SAT math scores. If you do this many times, the mean of the average scores you get will be close to what? So now we have to think about our vocabulary that we've seen before. So we know if you get enough data, you're going to get close to the population mean. So if we look back here, the population mean was 515. So we expect that our mean is going to get close to this population mean of 515. These other options where they're dividing by 100 and dividing by the square root of 100, we don't do those kinds of calculations with the mean. So we expect that the average is going to get close to the population average, the more people or the more students we interview. Question E asks about the standard deviation. So it's giving us the same information, but then it's saying if you do this many times, the standard deviation of the average scores you get will be close to what? So now we have to look back at our sample standard deviation formula because this comes from a simple random sample of 100 students. So you can check that formula on page 183 and see that it looks like part C, where you're taking the standard deviation and then dividing it by the square root of 100 because our sample size n was 100 students. We know the square root of 100 is 10, so we can simplify in our heads that 114 divided by 10 is 11.4. So what happens when you take a sample is that your graph gets compressed, right? And so when we're compressing the graph because we have a smaller amount of data that's going to bring everything in and give us a smaller standard deviation because the graph is like it's like the x-axis got squished kind of. Question F asks about a light bulb. So it tells us the number of hours a light bulb burns before failing varies from bulb to bulb. The distribution of the burnout times is strongly skewed to the right. Okay, so this graph would have a long right tail. And then it's asking us, what does the central limit theorem say? So the central limit theorem says what question or what choice C is saying. That the average burnout time of a large number of bulbs has a distribution that is close to normal. 